Part One, Chapter Five of Mushrooms on the Moor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum. Part One, Chapter Five. Landlord and Tenant. I heard a capital story the other evening under the most astonishing circumstances. I was at a public meeting connected with a religious conference. A certain minister rose to address us. We knew from past experience that we should have a most suggestive and stimulating address. But somehow it did not occur to us that we should be favoured with a story. And when this grave and sedate member of our assembly suddenly launched out into the intricacies of his tale, it was as great a surprise as though the hail drops turned out to be diamonds, or Vesuvius had begun to pour forth gold. Before we knew what had happened, we were electrified by the story of a man who dwelt in a very comfortable house, with a large, light, airy cellar. The river ran nearby. One day, the river overflowed, the cellar was flooded, and all the hens that he kept in it were drowned. The next day, he bounced off to see the landlord. "'I have come,' he said, "'to give you notice. I wish to leave the house.' "'How is that?' asked the astonished landlord. "'I thought you liked it so much.' It is a very comfortable, well-built house, and cheap. Oh, yes, the tenant replied, but the river has overflowed into my cellar, and all my hens are drowned. Oh, don't let that make you give up the house, the landlord reasoned. Try ducks. I entirely forget, I most fervently hope that my friend will never see this lamentable confession of mine, I entirely forget what he made of this delightful story. But looking back on it now, I can see quite clearly that half the philosophy of life is wrapped up in its delicious folds. It raises the question at the very outset as to how far I am under any obligation to endure the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. The river has flooded my cellar and drowned all my hens. Very well. Now two courses are open to me. Shall I grin and bear it, or shall I make a change? I must remember that it is very nice living on the banks of the river. There is the boathouse at the foot of the garden. What delightful hours we have spent gliding up and down the bends and reaches of the tranquil stream, watching the reflections in the water, and picnicking under willows on its grassy banks. How the children love to come down here and feed the swans, as the graceful creatures glide proudly hither and thither, seeming to be conscious that their beauty richly deserves all the homage that is paid to it. The fishing, too. The whir of the line, and the bend of the rod, and the splash of the trout. Why, there was more concentrated excitement in some of those tremendous moments than in all the politics and battles since the world began. And the bathing. On those hot summer days, when the very air seemed to scorch the skin, how exquisite those swirling waters seemed. Am I to give up all this enjoyment because, once in five years perhaps, the swollen stream floods my cellar and drowns my hens? That is the question, and it is a live question too. Now, the trouble is a little deeper than appears on the surface. For if I persuade myself that it is my duty to bounce off down to the owner of the house and give him notice to quit, I shall soon find myself spending a considerable proportion of my time in waiting upon my landlords. In the next house to which I go, I shall not only miss the boating and fishing and bathing, but I shall within six months discover other disadvantages quite as grave as the occasional flooding of my riverside cellar. And then I shall have to move again. And moving will become a habit with me. And on the whole, it is a bad habit. It may be good for the hens, but there are other things to be considered besides hens. The solar system is not kept in operation solely for the benefit of the hens in the cellar. There are the children, and with all respect for the fowlyard, children are as much worthy of consideration as chickens. It is not good for children to be everlastingly moving. It is good for them to have sacred and beautiful memories of the home of their childhood. It is good for them to feed the swans, and play under the willows year in year out, and to retain the swans and the willows as part of the background with which memory will always paint the picture of their infancy. It is good for children to feel a certain fixity and stability about home and school and friends. George Gissing pathetically tells how the spirit of dereliction stole into the life of Godwin Peake. It was all owing to the family gypsings. As a result of the family's removal first from London to the farm, and then into Twybridge, Godwin had no friends of old standing. A boy reaps advantage from the half-parental kindness of men and women who have watched his growth from infancy. In general, it affects him as a steadying influence, keeping before his mind the social bonds to which his behaviour owes allegiance. Godwin had no ties which bound him strongly to any district. 
he was like a ship that belongs to no port in particular and that drifts hither and thither about the world as fugitive commissions may arise the finest of all the fine arts is the art of putting up with nasty things it is not very nice to have all your hens drowned you get fond of hens and apart from the financial loss involved there is a sense of bereavement in seeing all your choice dorkings your favourite leghorns your lovely orpingtons or your beautiful silver wine dotters all lying dead and bedraggled in the muddy cellar few things are more disconcerting and yet i am writing this article for no other purpose than to assert that the best thing to do if you must have hens is to bury these as quickly as possible and send down to the market for a fresh supply it is certainly gratifying to one's pride as a tenant to feel that one has a grievance and can now show his glorious independence of the landlord there is always a pleasurable piquancy in being able to resign or dismiss somebody or give notice but my interest is every bit as well worth considering as my dignity and whilst my dignity clamours to get even with the landlord my interest reminds me of the swans and the willows the boating and the fishing my dignity shouts angrily about my dead hens but my interest whispers significantly about my living children so all things considered it is better to bury the hens and the hatchet at the same time i may quit my riverside residence and have a waterproof fowl run in another street but when i see somebody else taking his children out in my old boat i shall only bite my lip and wish that i had quietly restocked my chicken run it may be a most iniquitous proceeding on the part of the landlord to allow the river to flood my cellar but thinking it over calmly i am convinced that it is my duty as a christian to forgive him and it always pays a man to do his duty i had thought of devoting a paragraph to ministers and deacons but perhaps i had better not these matters are very intricate and very delicate and need a tenderer touch than mine sometimes things will go wrong the river will rise the cellar gets flooded and the hens get drowned but really i am certain that nine times out of ten perhaps ninety-nine times out of a hundred it is better to bury the poor birds quietly and say no more about it i don't know quite how to apply this parable i was afraid i should get out of my depth if i ventured into such matters but suppose that the minister finds some morning that his cellar is flooded and his pet birds drowned of course it is pleasant to send in your resignation and say that you will not stand it and yet and yet rivers will rise it is a way that rivers have and the church secretary when he receives the resignation feels as helpless as the landlord and has the minister any guarantee that the next river on the banks of which he builds his nest will never rise and even if he is certain of perfection in the fields to which he flies is he quite justified in avenging his dead hens by imperiling his living children and his living church or perhaps i have misinterpreted the story i am really very nervous about it and feel that i have plunged into things too high for me perhaps the minister is the landlord it is through his wickedness the river has risen and drowned some of the church's best hens or at least ruffled the fine feathers of some of the church's best birds it is the easiest thing in the world to give him notice to quit and it accords magnificently with the dignity of the situation but are we quite sure that the poor minister made the river rise that is the question the tenant ought to consider was it the landlord's fault i repeat that rivers will rise at times generally at storm times the nile and the tigris used to rise in prehistoric times it is a way rivers have i really think that it will be as well to say no more about it try to smooth down the ruffled feathers and forget it may not have been his fault and anyhow we shall be saying good-bye to a good many delightful experiences if we part company and really when you think it over quietly there seems to be a great deal in the landlord's suggestion try ducks of course ducks are the very thing for a riverside dwelling every change however small should be dictated by reason and not by caprice this was the essential difference between the stupid tenant and the wise landlord the tenant said i will make a fundamental change and i will make it capriciously i will leave the house the landlord said why not make an incidental change and make it reasonably try ducks i have in my time seen great numbers of people among all kinds and conditions of men throw up their riverside dwellings in high dudgeon because their hens were drowned in the cellar but among my saddest letters i find some from those who tell me how they miss the swans and the boathouse the trout and the willows and how sincerely they wish now that they had tried ducks but it is too late the flashing stream is the paradise of other tenants 
and the children's most romantic memory of childhood twines itself about the fun of getting the piano and the dining-room table in and out of the different doors we may easily form a stupid habit of giving the landlord notice whenever the river happens to rise and we forget that it is from just such movements such goings and stayings that life as a whole takes its tint and colour destiny is made of trifles our weal and our woe are determined by comparatively insignificant issues somebody has finally said that we make our decisions and then our decisions turn round and make us now let nobody suppose that i am deprecating a change on the contrary i am advocating a change it will never do to let the fowls drown and to take no steps to prevent a recurrence of any such disaster i hold no brief for stagnation i am merely insisting that the change must commend itself to heart and conscience and reason it must be a forward move look at this for example it is from stanley's life of arnold we are all in the midst of confusion arnold writes from lalaham the books all packed and half the furniture and on tuesday if god will we shall leave this dear place this nine years home of such exceeding happiness but it boots not to look backwards forward 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 should be one's motto and thus arnold moved to rugby and made history there are times when the landlord's gate is the high road to glory the whole matter is capable of the widest application and must be scientifically treated man is always finding his fowls drowned in the cellar and going the wrong way to put things right generally speaking it must be confessed that he is too fond of rushing off to the landlord in his travels in russia theophile gautier has a striking word concerning this perilous proclivity whatever is of real use to man he says was invented from the beginning of the world and all the people who have come along since have worn their brains out to find something new but have made no improvements change is far from being progress it is not yet proved that steamers are better than sailing vessels or railways than horse traffic for my part i believe that men will end in returning to the old methods which are always the best i do not agree with the first part of gautier's statement it is not likely but when he says that we are getting back to our starting point his contention is indisputable in the beginning man was alone with his earth and all that he did he did in the sweat of his brow then came the craze for machinery and the world became a network of wires and a wilderness of whirling wheels but we are beginning to recognize that it has been a ridiculous mistake the thing is too clumsy and too complicated mr marconi has already taught us to feel half ashamed of the wires and mr h g wells predicts that in forty years time all the activities of a larger and busier world will be driven by invisible currents of power and the whole of our industrial machinery will have gone to the scrap heap man will find himself once more alone with his world but it will be a world that has taken him into its confidence and revealed to him its wonderful secrets he will look back with a smile on the age of screaming sirens and snorting engines of racing pistons and whirling wheels he will be amazed at his own earlier readiness to resort to such a cumbrous and complicated system when a smaller transition would have ushered him into his kingdom the whole drift of our modern scientific development is away from our clinking mechanical complexities and back towards the great primal simplicities we have been too fond of the drastic and dramatic course too fond of bouncing off to the landlord we are too apt to involve ourselves in a big move when we might have gained our point by simply trying ducks we love the things that are burdensome the ways that are involved the paths that lead to headache and heartache it is a very ancient and very human tendency paul wrote the epistle to the galatians to reprove in them the same sad blunder o foolish galatians who hath bewitched you they had abandoned the simplicities under the lure of the complexities the church that was urged by her lord to return to her first love had made the same mistake we are too prone to scorn the simple and the obvious we forsake the fountain of living water and hew out to ourselves clumsy cisterns we neglect the majestic simplicities of the gospel and involve our tired brains and hungry hearts in tortuous systems that lead us a long long way from home the landlord is right the simplest course is almost always the safest End of part one, chapter five.